What's up investors? Welcome to Heresy Financial. This is the show where we talk about investing, finances, economics, news in a way that's considered heresy to the financial establishment. Uh, today we're talking about what to do with all that cash. Uh, recently there have been reports about all the cash that investors have on the sidelines right now. So thought I'd make a quick video to help you guys out since it looks like most people are not sure what to do with their money right now in the wake of all this uncertainty. Let's dive in. All right, if you're somebody that is holding on to a lot of cash right now, I'd be willing to bet that it is in one of three forms. Number one, it's in a checking account or a savings account at your bank. They're probably paying you zero to little interest on your cash. In return for that, they're likely not charging you fees in order to hold on to your cash. Now, just as a side note, if they're not paying you interest and they are charging you fees to hold an account there, you might wanna take a look at some of your other options out there. There are a lot of banks out there that don't charge you fees to hold an account and at least pay you a small amount of interest. Now, one more side note to go a little bit deeper down the rabbit hole. The current target for inflation set by the Federal Reserve is 2%. That's not a 2% every year though. That's on average 2% when you look back a number of years. And so since in the past number of years, it's been a little bit lower than 2%, for some reason, they are trying to make up for that. I've talked about why before that they need inflation because of all the debt and because of their balance sheet, but let's not get into that. They're targeting 2% on average, which means they're trying to achieve more than 2% right now in order to make up for lost time, which means that if your bank account is not paying you at least 2%, you are losing money. Because if your dollar loses 2% from inflation each year and gains maybe 1% from the interest that it's paid, the purchasing power that your dollar has after a year is 1% less. Now, you're likely not gonna find a bank account out there that you really like that's gonna pay you as much as inflation because let's be honest, the Federal Reserve needs inflation and so the amount that they say is actually happening the, through the CPI is going to be uh, false. It's not going to be up to reality. There are lots of numbers out there on what the average inflation really is and it depends in cities, but most of the big cities are somewhere around five to 10%. Okay, enough with that rabbit trail. Your cash is probably in a checking account or a savings account paying you a little bit of interest. The other place your cash might be is in a money market account. So if you have any dollars that are not invested in a brokerage account or in a retirement account, this is where they're sitting. It's gonna be something called a money market fund. And a money market fund to you looks like just cash because you can access it whenever you want. And I'll explain what they do with that money in a moment. Now the third place you might have your cash is in something like a CD. A CD is really a savings account that locks your money up for a certain amount of time in return for a guaranteed interest rate. Again, just like a savings account, but usually it's a little bit higher than what a savings account would usually pay just because you're guaranteeing that you're gonna leave it in there for that amount of time. Now let's take a look at what each of these vehicles does with your cash because your money's not just sitting in an account. The bank or the fund or the institution is putting that money to work. They're able to do this through something called the fractional reserve system. And so if the bank receives $100,000 in deposits, they're gonna take 90,000 of those deposits and they're gonna loan them out to people in the form of credit card debt, auto loans, and mortgages. Yes, that means that if everybody goes to the bank and tries to get their money out at the exact same time, they won't be able to. This is what used to cause bank runs back before the Federal Reserve in 1913 and all throughout the 1800s as well. You would have banks that wouldn't actually keep enough reserves on hand in order to re refund deposits that people wanted to withdraw if there were too many of them at the same time because they would loan them out to people. In that case, there was a run on the bank and the first people in line basically got their funds back and everybody else did not. And so the bank would close because they have no more money left. Yes, this should have been outlawed. No, that didn't happen. Instead, they created the Federal Reserve, which basically nationalized this practice. And instead of one bank failing, they just created a coalition of all banks and said that if a bank run happens on one bank, all of the other banks will basically step in and provide the funds. Now what this does is it transfers the risk from the individual nodes of the system to the entire system as a whole. That makes a system fragile where it was anti-fragile before. Because in a system where each node is vulnerable to collapse, eventually you'll have all of the vulnerable ones collapse and die out and the entire system will be stronger because only the strong ones will be left. But instead they made the system fragile by transferring the risk from the individual nodes, the individual banks to the entire system. And so now when there's a run on the bank, 
that bank doesn't fail. But now we have systemic collapses available at every turn, which is way better, right? Okay, so back to your checking account. What the bank does with your checking account money is they loan it out to people. They're making 18% on the credit card loans, they're making 6% on the car loans, and they're making 4% on the mortgages. So they give you one-tenth of 1% of that. Sounds like a great deal, right? All right, now on to the other one, money market funds. Now, money market funds do not operate like banks. They don't loan your money out to more of the risky loans like credit cards. However, they do use the, your money for their own benefit. Usually what they do is they buy things like treasuries because treasuries are considered guaranteed and they're the safest assets out there because the government can always tax or inflate in order to pay the treasuries back. And so a money market fund, which are, again, the vehicles used to hold the cash in a retirement account or a brokerage account, are making a little bit of money on the interest from things like treasuries, and they're paying you a little bit less of that. So they make a small spread. The other thing that these money market funds will do with your cash is they'll loan it out in the repo market. Now I've talked about the repo market before, I've got a couple of videos on that, you should go back and check them out if you're interested in what the repo market is and the dangers that it's causing in the market right now. But essentially money market funds, which again, hold all the cash in all retirement accounts and brokerage accounts, loan cash out in the repo market overnight. And in return for that, they get, you guessed it, treasuries. And then when the repo market trade settles up, the treasuries go back and they get their cash back with the interest. And again, a small portion of that interest goes to you. Okay, now the last place that I said you probably have your cash is in something like a CD. And again, it's just like a savings account, except it's got a little timer on it and you can't pull your money out until that timer ticks, which is usually anywhere between a month or 10 years. And then you get your money back with all the interest. Now I challenge you to find a CD out there that is paying more than inflation. You're probably not gonna find any, but even if you do, it's gonna be a small amount more than stated inflation and nowhere near real inflation. So those are the three areas you probably have your cash. And especially millennials right now who kind of entered the workforce and became adults as the financial crisis was happening, they're scared of the market, they're scared of housing, and so most people right now that fit into this category do not own any homes and do not own many stocks or investments at all. And usually they have pretty well paying jobs because they've been in the workforce long enough now to get promoted and gain some skills, but they don't want to invest because they're scared, especially with what's happening economically right now. And I don't blame them. There are lots of things to be concerned about. And so there's a massive amount of money piling up in cash right now. Another area where people are piling up cash is the older generation. Again, concerned about safety, doesn't have a lot of time to risk and be in the stock market and wait another 10 to 15 years for it to come back. So stay on the sidelines with cash. Here's the problem. Cash is probably one of the riskiest assets to hold on to right now. You see, if you look at economic history, and when I say history, I don't mean 20 years. 20 years is not history. If you look back 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, you can see patterns emerge over and over and over and over again. And credit crises are a pattern. And we see a lot of signs right now that show that America and the world and corporations and governments are nearing the end of this credit cycle and we're about to have a credit crisis. The world is way over leveraged right now. And it's being exacerbated by the fact that central banks are making it easier for debt to continue. And we're in an environment where debt should be contracting, debt should be being paid down, but instead it's getting more or being rolled over. So we see a lot of signs that look very similar to credit crises that have happened over and over and over and over again for the past thousand years. Because there's nothing new or revolutionary or crazy about the money environment that we're in right now. Virtual money has existed for thousands of years. It was actually the first form of money, credit. And so this environment that we're in right now that economists say is unprecedented and new and a product of the enlightenment is just not true. Virtual money was the first form of money. Gold coins actually came after that. Barter never existed as a monetary system. And so the environment that we're in right now where money is virtual and it's all based on credit is one of the oldest games in the book. The good thing about that is that you can look at what's happened in the past and see signs for what's gonna happen in the future. The bad part is it doesn't look good. So. What to do with your cash? Well, if you look at what happens to fiat currencies, they fail. There's never been a fiat currency that has existed in perpetuity and held its value over time. And to be honest, 50 years since the world completely left the gold standard is a blip of history. And especially on a small scale, you've seen countries go through this cycle over and over and over again throughout history and fiat currencies 
fail. There's always a return to real sound money at some point afterwards. So the number one thing that people need to do with their cash right now is get rid of it. Because the only thing that's gonna happen with cash, paper currency, that's not backed by anything of value, is deteriorate. Imagine you're measuring a house that you're building. You're gonna need a tape measure that doesn't change, right? Because if you're building a house and you have a tape measure where the inch size continues to change, well, as you move through the building of the house, nothing's gonna fit together. The walls aren't gonna fit on the foundation. The roof isn't gonna fit on the walls. You're gonna have walls that don't match up with each other. The entire house is gonna crumble. It's the same thing with the economy because the economy and data and studies and numbers and policy decisions are all based on the assumption that the value of the dollar doesn't change. But the problem is it changes. It changes every year and it drops in value every single year. And we know it does because it drops in value by at least 2% every year because that is the Federal Reserve's target. And because they have an incentive to make inflation larger than what it actually is reported at, we can safely assume that it's at least a little bit more than 2%. And when you look at studies that look at the most popular items bought per city, normally you find that the inflation per city is a lot higher than the Fed's target. And so the first thing that anybody needs to do who wants to preserve their purchasing power is get out of the dollar. And I don't mean go get euros and I don't mean go get yen. I mean get out of paper currency that doesn't have anything of value backing it up. So could you buy gold? Absolutely. And when I say buy gold, I actually mean buy physical precious metal gold coins. Could you do that? Absolutely. It's something of value. Could you become a prepper and start buying commodities and food and water and storing up on things just in case prices skyrocket? Absolutely, you could do that. Could you buy stocks, even US equities, that I think are gonna have a huge correction? Absolutely, because long term, companies are gonna find a way to make money. Whether they have to move to other countries or sell other products or find different consumer bases, at some point, a large corporation is going to figure out how to make money again. The problem is when a dollar or when a currency stops being worth anything, the only thing that happens is a new currency comes into play. That means the old one is worthless. I would rather own stocks that could lose half their value in a split second that have the long-term potential to come back than own a currency that has never, ever, ever done that in the history of existing. Paper currencies or fiat currencies money backed by nothing of value doesn't rebound. It simply deteriorates into nothingness. And so if I was holding on to a lot of cash right now, which I'm not, the first thing I would do is find somewhere to put it. Because number one, when the bank runs start to happen, the system is gonna collapse. The last time the system started to collapse, the Federal Reserve rescued us by buying up all the bad assets to preserve the plumbing of the financial system. They didn't want all the banks collapsing. The problem is we're already at or near zero interest rates all around the world. And so when this starts to happen, you're not gonna have the capacity to make the move to easy money like they did last time because we're already so low. So the system itself is at risk. So I would not have a lot of money in checking or savings accounts or CDs because if the system collapses, you might just see them disappear. I also wouldn't have my money in cash just for the reason that it's deteriorating in value. And I'm never gonna find a guaranteed investment that's going to pay me as much as inflation is taking away from me each year. Could you buy real estate? Absolutely. Just know that in really hard times, the supply of real estate increases. And so if you buy a rental property, you might see it unrented for a certain amount of time while things recover. But the more doors that you have and the more rental properties that you have, the higher likelihood that your entire real estate portfolio will be able to generate positive cash flow. And as costs increase and prices go up, rents go up as well. And so real estate is an area that is uh, at least partially protected against inflation. Could you buy bonds? Sure, but just like cash, when the cash system collapses, bonds will be defaulted on. And if they're not defaulted on outright, they'll be defaulted on technically through inflation. So this is kind of my public service announcement to all of my fellow millennials and all of the older generation that is holding on to a lot of safe assets like cash and bonds and CDs and money market funds because there's a high likelihood that those are some of the riskiest investments or places to hold your money right now. Now, if you're sold on this and you think, yes, I wanna get my money out of cash, but 
I don't wanna be susceptible to a 50% drop in the stock market if I go buy stocks. Look at options, because there are ways that you can protect a stock portfolio using options on your account, as long as you can get an account that's approved for options trading at your stock broker. If you've never heard of options before, I do have a training course on it. I'll link it in the description below. You can take a look at that. It'll teach you how to trade options and how to use them conservatively to protect your account. So that's all I have for you today. Again, if you have a lot of cash, I would highly consider doing something less risky than holding on to something that could be wiped out in a split second. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, please like and subscribe and share with a friend, help a small channel out. You guys have a great day.